Russian Fairy Tales by William Ralston Shedden Ralston. Chapter 1, Part 1. Introductory. There are but few among those inhabitants of fairyland of whom popular tales tell, who are better known to the outer world than Cinderella, the despised and flouted younger sister who long sits unnoticed beside the hearth, then furtively visits the glittering halls of the great and gay, and at last is transferred from her obscure nook to the place of honor justly due to her tardily acknowledged merits. Somewhat like the fortunes of Cinderella have been those of the popular tale itself. Long did it dwell beside the hearths of the common people, utterly ignored by their superiors in social rank. Then came a period during which the cultured world recognized its existence, but accorded it to no higher rank than it allotted to nursery stories and old wives' tales, except indeed on those rare occasions when the charity of a condescending scholar had invested it with such a garb as was supposed to enable it to make a respectable appearance in polite society. At length there arrived the season of its final change, when, transferred from the dusk of the peasant's hut into the full light of the outer day, and freed from the unbecoming garments by which it had been disfigured, it was recognized as a scion of a family so truly royal that some of its members deduce their origin from the olden gods themselves. In our days, the folk tale, instead of being left to the careless guardianship of youth and ignorance, is sedulously tended and held in high honor by the ripest of scholars. Their views with regard to its origin may differ widely, but whether it be considered in one of its phases as a distorted nature myth or in another as a demoralized apologue or parable, whether it be regarded at one time as a relic of primeval wisdom or at another as a blurred transcript of a page of medieval history, its critics agree in declaring it to be no mere creation of the popular fancy, no chance expression of the uncultured thought of the rude tiller of this or that soil. Rather, it is believed of most folk tales that they, in their original forms, were framed centuries upon centuries ago, while of some of them it is supposed that they may be traced back through successive ages to those myths in which, during a prehistoric period, the oldest of philosophers expressed their ideas relative to the material or the spiritual world. But it is not every popular tale which can boast of so noble a lineage and one of the great difficulties which beset the mythologist who attempts to discover the original meaning of folk tales in general is to decide which of them are really antique and worthy, therefore, of being submitted to critical analysis. Nor is it less difficult when dealing with the stories of any one country in particular to settle which may be looked upon as its own property and which ought to be considered as borrowed and adapted. Everyone knows that the existence of the greater part of the stories current among the various European peoples is accounted for on two different hypotheses. The one supposing that most of them were common in germ at least to the Aryan tribes before their migration, and that, therefore, these traditions are as much a portion of the common inheritance of our ancestors as their language unquestionably is the other regarding at least a great part of them as foreign importations, oriental fancies which were originally introduced into Europe through a series of translations by the pilgrims and merchants who were always linking the East and the West together, or by the emissaries of some of the heretical sects, or in the train of such warlike transferers as the Crusaders, or the Arabs who ruled in Spain, or the Tatars who so long held the Russia of old times in their grasp. According to the former supposition, these very stories, these Mierschen, which nurses still tell with almost the same words, in the Thuringian forest and in the Norwegian villages, and to which crowds of children listen under the pipal trees of India, belong to the common heirloom of the Indo-European race, According to the latter, the majority of European popular tales are merely naturalized aliens in Europe, being as little the inheritance of its present inhabitants as were the stories and fables which 
by a circuitous route, were transmitted from India to Boccaccio or La Fontaine. On the questions to which these two conflicting hypotheses give rise, we will not now dwell. For the present, we will deal with the Russian folk tale as we find it, attempting to become acquainted with its principal characteristics to see in what respects it chiefly differs from the stories of the same class which are current among ourselves, or in those foreign lands with which we are more familiar than we are with Russia, rather than to explore its birthplace or divine its original meaning. We often hear it said that from the songs and stories of a country we may learn much about the inner life of its people. Inasmuch as popular utterances of this kind always bear the stamp of the national character, offer a reflex of the national mind. So far as folk songs are concerned, this statement appears to be well founded, but it can be applied to the folk tales of Europe only within very narrow limits. Each country possesses certain stories which have special reference to its own manners and customs, and by collecting such tales as these, something approximating to a picture of its national life may be laboriously pieced together. But the stories of this class are often nothing more than comparatively modern adaptations of old and foreign themes, nor are they sufficiently numerous, so far as we can judge from existing collections, to render by any means complete the national portrait for which they are expected to supply the materials. In order to fill up the gaps they leave, it is necessary to bring together a number of fragments taken from stories which evidently refer to another clime, fragments which may be looked upon as excrescences or developments due to the novel influences to which the foreign slip or seedling or even full-grown plant has been subjected since its transportation. The great bulk of the Russian folk tales, and indeed of those of all the Indo-European nations, is devoted to the adventures of such fairy princes and princesses, such snakes and giants and demons, as are quite out of keeping with ordinary men and women, at all events with the inhabitants of modern Europe, since the termination of those internecine struggles between aboriginals and invaders which some commenters see typified in the combats between the heroes of our popular tales and the whole race of giants, trolls, ogres, snakes, dragons, and other monsters. The air we breathe in them is that of fairyland. The conditions of existence, the relations between the human race and the spiritual world, on the one hand, the material world on the other, are totally inconsistent with those to which we are now restricted. There is boundless freedom of intercourse between mortals and immortals, between mankind and the brute creation, and although there are certain conventional rules which must always be observed, they are not those which are enforced by any people known to anthropologists. The stories which are common to all Europe differ, no doubt, in different countries, but their variations, so far as their matter is concerned, seem to be due less to the moral character than to the geographical distribution of their readers. The manner in which these tales are told, however, may often be taken as a test of the intellectual capacity of their tellers, for in style the folk tale changes greatly as it travels. A story which we find narrated in one country with terseness and precision may be rendered almost unintelligible in another by vagueness or verbiage, by one race it may be elevated into poetic life, and by another may be degraded into the most prosaic dullness. Now, so far as style is concerned, the skazkas, or Russian folk tales, may justly be said to be characteristic of the Russian people. There are numerous points on which the lower classes of all the Aryan peoples in Europe closely resemble each other. But the Russian peasant has, in common with all his Slavonic brethren, a genuine talent for narrative which distinguishes him from some of his more distant cousins. And the stories which are current among the Russian peasantry are for the most part exceedingly well narrated. Their language is simple and pleasantly quaint, their humor is natural and unobtrusive, and their descriptions, whether of persons or of events, are often excellent. A taste for acting is widely spread in Russia, 
and the Russian folk tales are full of dramatic positions which offer a wide scope for a display of their reciter's mimetic talents. Every here and there, indeed, a tag of genuine comedy has evidently been attached by the storyteller to a narrative which in its original form was probably devoid of the comic element. And thus, from the Russian tales, may be derived some idea of the mental characteristics of the Russian peasantry, one which is very incomplete, but within its narrow limits sufficiently accurate. And a similar statement may be made with respect to the pictures of Russian peasant life contained in these tales. So far as they go, they are true to nature, and the notion which they convey to a stranger of the manners and customs of Russian villagers is not likely to prove erroneous, but they do not go very far. On some of the questions which are likely to be of the greatest interest to a foreigner, they never touch. There is very little information to be gleaned from them, for example, with regard to the religious views of the people, none with respect to the relations which, during the times of serfdom, existed between the lord and the thrall, but from the casual references to actual scenes and ordinary occupations which every here and there occur in the descriptions of fairyland and the narratives of heroic adventure, from the realistic vignettes which are sometimes inserted between the idealized portraits of invincible princes and irresistible princesses, some idea may be obtained of the usual aspect of a Russian village and of the ordinary behavior of its inhabitants. Turning from one to another of these accidental illustrations, we by degrees create a mental picture which is not without its peculiar charm. We see the wide sweep of the level cornland, the gloom of the interminable forest, the gleam of the slowly winding river. We pass along the single street of the village and glance at its wooden barn-like huts, so different from the ideal English cottage with its windows deep set in ivy and its porch smiling with roses. We see the land around a slough of despond in the spring, an unbroken sea of green in the early summer, a blaze of gold at harvest time, in the winter one vast sheet of all but untrodden snow. On Sundays and holidays we accompany the villagers to their white-walled, green-domed church, and afterwards listen to the songs which the girls sing in the summer choral dances, or take part in the merriment of the social gatherings which enliven the long nights of winter. Sometimes the quaint lyric drama of a peasant wedding is performed before our eyes. Sometimes we follow a funeral party to one of those dismal and desolate nooks in which the Russian villagers deposit their dead. On working days we see the peasants driving afield in the early morn with their long lines of carts to till the soil or ply the scythe or sickle or axe till the day is done and their rude carts come creaking back. We hear the songs and laughter of the girls beside the stream or pool which ripples pleasantly against its banks in the summertime, but in the winter shows no sign of life, except at the spot much frequented by the wives and daughters of the village where an ice hole has been cut in its massive pall. And at night we see the homely dwellings of the villagers assume a picturesque aspect, to which they are strangers by the tell-tale light of day their rough lines softened by the mellow splendor of a summer moon, or their unshapely forms looming forth mysteriously against the starlit snow of winter. Above all, we become familiar with those cottage interiors to which the stories contain so many references. Sometimes we see the better class of homestead, surrounded by its fence through which we pass between the oft-mentioned gates, after a glance at the barns and cattle sheds, and at the garden which supplies the family with fruits and vegetables, on flowers, alas, but little store is set in the northern provinces. We cross the threshold, a spot hallowed by many traditions, and pass through what in more pretentious houses may be called the vestibule into the living room. We become well acquainted with its arrangements, with the cellar beneath its wooden floor, with the corner of honor in which are placed the holy pictures, and with the stove which occupies so large a share of space within which daily beats as it were the heart of the house above which is nightly taken the repose of the family sometimes we visit the hut of a poverty-stricken peasant 
more like a shed for cattle than a human habitation, with a mud floor and a tattered roof through which the smoke makes its devious way. In these poorer dwellings we witness much suffering, but we learn to respect the patience and resignation with which it is generally borne, and in the greater part of the humble homes we visit, we become aware of the existence of many domestic virtues. We see numerous tokens of family affection, of filial reverence, of parental love, and when, as we pass along the village street at night, we see gleaming through the utter darkness the faint rays which tell us that even in many a poverty-stricken home a lamp is burning before the holy pictures, we feel that these poor tillers of the soil, ignorant and uncouth though they often are, may be raised at times by lofty thoughts and noble aspirations far above the low level of the dull and hard lives which they are forced to lead. From among the stories which contain the most graphic descriptions of Russian village life, or which may be regarded as specially illustrative of Russian sentiment and humor, those which the present chapter contain have been selected. Any information they may convey will necessarily be of a most fragmentary nature, but for all that it may be capable of producing a correct impression. A painter's rough notes and jottings are often more true to nature than the most finished picture into which they may be developed. The word skazka, or folk tale, does not very often occur in the popular Russian tales themselves. Still, there are occasions on which it appears. The allusions to it are for the most part indirect, as when a princess is said to be more beautiful than anybody ever was except in a skazka. But sometimes it obtains direct notice. In a story, for example, of a boy who had been carried off by a Baba Yaga, a species of witch, we are told that when his sister came to rescue, she found him sitting in an armchair while the cat Jeremiah told him skazkas and sang him songs. In another story, a durak, a ninny or gok, is sent to take care of the children of a village during the absence of their parents. Go and get all the children together in one of the cottages and tell them skazkas, or his instructions. He collects the children, but as they are all ever so dirty, he puts them into boiling water by way of cleansing them, and so washes them to death. There is a good deal of social life in the Russian villages during the long winter evenings, and at some of the gatherings which then take place, skazkas are told, though at those in which only the young people participate, songs, games, and dances are more popular. The following skazka has been selected on account of the descriptions of a vachernitsa, or village soiree, and of a rustic courtship which its opening scene contains. The rest of the story is not remarkable for its fidelity to modern life, but it will serve as a good illustration of the class to which it belongs, that of stories about evil spirits, traceable for the most part to Eastern sources. End of chapter 1, part 1. Recording by Kevin Davidson, www.blogordie.com Part 2. The Fiend In a certain country there lived an old couple who had a daughter called Mariusha. In their village it was customary to celebrate the feast of St. Andrew the First called, November 30th. The girls used to assemble in some cottage, bake pampushki, and enjoy themselves for a whole week or even longer. Well, the girls met together once this festival arrived, and brewed and baked what was wanted. In the evening came the lads with the music, bringing liquor with them, and dancing and revelry commenced. All the girls danced well, but Marussia was the best of all. After a while there came into the cottage such a fine fellow, Mary come up, regular blood and milk, and smartly and richly dressed. Hail, fair maidens, says he. Hail, good youth, say they. You're merrymaking. Be so good as to join us. Thereupon he pulled out of his pocket a purse full of gold, ordered liquor, nuts, and gingerbread. All was ready in a trice, and he began treating the lads and lasses, giving each a share. Then he took to dancing. Why, it was a treat to look at him. 
Marussia struck his fancy more than anyone else, so he stuck close to her. The time came for going home. Marussia, says he, come and see me off. She went to see him off. Marussia, my sweetheart, says he, would you like me to marry you? If you like to marry me, I would gladly marry you. But where do you come from? From such and such a place. I'm a clerk at a merchant's. Then they bade each other farewell and separated. When Marussia got home, her mother asked her, Well, daughter, have you enjoyed yourself? Yes, mother, but I've something pleasant to tell you besides. There was a lad from the neighborhood, good-looking, with lots of money, and he promised to marry me. Arky, Marussia, when you go to where the girls are tomorrow, take a ball of thread with you, make a noose in it, and when you are going to see him off, throw it over one of his buttons, and quietly unroll the ball. Then, by means of the thread, you will be able to find out where he lives. Next day, Marusha went to the gathering and took a ball of thread with her. The youth came again. Good evening, Marusha, said he. Good evening, said she. Games began and dances. Even more than before did he stick to Marusha. Not a step would he budge from her. The time came for going home. Come and see me off, Marusha, says the stranger. She went out into the street, and while she was taking leave of him, she quietly dropped the noose over one of his buttons. He went his way, but she remained where she was, unrolling the ball. When she had unrolled the whole of it, she ran after the thread to find out where her betrothed lived. At first the thread followed the road, then it stretched across hedges and ditches and led Marussia towards the church and right up to the porch. Marussia tried the door. It was locked. She went round the window and climbed up to see what was going on inside. Having got into the church, she looked and saw her betrothed standing beside a grave and devouring a dead body, for a corpse had been left for that night in the church. She wanted to get down the ladder quietly, but her fright prevented her from taking proper heed, and she made a little noise. And then she ran home, almost beside herself, fancying all the time she was being pursued. She was all but dead before she got in. Next morning, her mother asked her, Well, Marusha, did you see the youth? I saw him, mother, she replied, but... What else she had seen she did not tell. In the morning Marusha was sitting, considering whether she would go to the gathering or not. Go, said her mother, amuse yourself while you're young. So she went to the gathering. The fiend was there already. Games, fun, dancing began anew. The girls knew nothing of what had happened. When they began to separate and go homewards, Come, Marusha, says the evil one, see me off. She was afraid and didn't stir. Then all the other girls opened out upon her. What are you thinking about? Have you grown so bashful, forsooth? Go and see the good lad off. And there was no help for it. Out she went, not knowing what would become of it. As soon as they got into the streets, he began questioning her. You were in the church last night? No. And saw what I was doing there? No. But he will. Tomorrow your father will die. Having said this, he disappeared. Marusha returned home grave and sad. When she woke up in the morning, her father lay dead. They wept and wailed over him and laid him in the coffin. In the evening, her mother went off to the priests, but Marusha remained at home. At last, she became afraid of being alone in the house. Suppose I go back to my friends, she thought. So she went and found the evil one there. Good evening, Marusia. Why aren't you merry? How can I be merry? My father is dead. Oh, poor thing. They all grieved for her. Even the accursed one himself grieved, just as if it hadn't all been his own doing. By and by they began saying farewell and going home. Marusia, says he, see me off. She didn't want to. What are you thinking of, child? insist the girls. What are you afraid of? Go and see him off. So she went to see him off. They passed out into the street. 
Tell me, Marusha, says he, you were in the church. No. Did you see what I was doing? No. Very well. Tomorrow your mother will die. He spoke and disappeared. Marusha returned home sadder than ever. The night went by. Next morning, when she awoke, her mother lay dead. She cried all day long, but when the sun set, it grew dark around. Marusia became afraid of being left alone, so she went to her companions. "'Why, whatever is the matter with you? You're clean out of countenance,' say the girls. "'How am I likely to be cheerful? Yesterday my father died, and today my mother.' "'Poor thing, poor unhappy girl!' they all exclaimed sympathizingly. Well, the time came to say goodbye. "'See me off, Marusia,' says the fiend. So she went out to see him off. "'Tell me, were you in the church?' "'No.' "'And saw what I was doing?' "'No.' "'Very well. Tomorrow evening you will die yourself.' Marusia spent the night with her friends. In the morning she got up and considered what she should do. She bethought herself that she had a grandmother an old, very old woman who had become blind from length of years. Suppose I go and ask her advice, she said, and then went off to her grandmother's. Good day, Granny, says she. Good day, granddaughter. What news is there with you? How are your father and mother? They are dead, Granny, replied the girl, and then she told her all that had happened. The old woman listened and said, Oh, dear me, my poor unhappy child. Go quickly to the priest and ask him this favor, that if you die, your body shall not be taken out of the house through the doorway, but that the ground shall be dug away from under the threshold, and you shall be dragged out through that opening. Also beg that you may be buried at a crossway, at a spot where four roads meet. Marusha went to the priest, wept bitterly, and made him promise to do everything according to her grandmother's instructions. Then she returned home, bought a coffin, lay down in it, and straightway expired. Well, they told the priest, and he buried first her father and mother, and then Rusia herself. Her body was passed underneath the threshold and buried at a crossway. Soon afterwards, a senior son happened to drive past Marusha's grave. On that grave he saw growing a wondrous flower, such a one as he had never seen before. Said the young senior to his servant, "'Go and pluck that flower by the roots. We'll take it home and put it in a flower pot. Perhaps it will blossom there.' Well, they dug up the flower, took it home, put it in a glazed flower pot, and set it in a window. The flower began to grow larger and more beautiful. One night the servant hadn't gone to sleep somehow, and he happened to be looking at the window when he saw a wondrous thing take place. All of a sudden the flower began to tremble, and it fell from its stem to the ground and turned into a lovely maiden. The flower was beautiful, but the maiden was more beautiful still. She wandered from room to room got herself various things to eat and drink, ate and drank, then stamped upon the ground and became a flower as before, mounted to the window and resumed her place upon the stem. Next day the servant told the young senior of the wonders that he had seen during the night. Ha, brother, said the youth, why didn't you wake me? Tonight we'll both keep watch together. The night came, they slept not, but watched. Exactly at twelve o'clock, the blossom began to shake, flew from place to place, and then fell to the ground, and the beautiful maiden appeared, got herself things to eat and drink, and sat down to supper. The young senior rushed forward and seized her by her white hands. Impossible was it for him sufficiently to look at her, to gaze on her beauty. Next morning he said to his father and mother, "'Please allow me to get married. I've found myself a bride.' His parents gave their consent. As for Marusia, she said, "'Only on this condition will I marry you, "'that for four years I need not go to church.' "'Very good,' said he. "'Well, they were married, "'and they lived together one year, 
two years and had a son. But one day they had visitors at their house who enjoyed themselves and drank and began bragging about their wives. This one's wife was handsome, that one's was handsomer still. You may say what you like, said the host, but a handsomer wife than mine does not exist in the whole world. Handsome, yes, replied the guest, but a heathen. How so? Why, she never goes to church. Her husband found these observations distasteful. He waited till Sunday and then told his wife to get dressed for church. I don't care what you may say, said he. Go and get ready directly. Well, they got ready and went to church. The husband went in, didn't see anything particular. But when she looked round, there was the fiend sitting at a window. Ah, here you are at last, he cried. Remember old times when you were in the church that night? No. And did you see what I was doing there? No. Very well. Tomorrow both your husband and your son will die. Marusha rushed straight out of the church and away to her grandmother. The old woman gave her two files, the one full of holy water, the other the water of life, and told her what she was to do. Next day both Marusha's husband and her son died. Then the fiend came flying to her and asked, Tell me, were you in the church? I was. And did you see what I was doing? You were eating a corpse. She spoke and splashed the holy water over him. In a moment he turned to mere dust and ashes, which blew to the winds. Afterward she sprinkled her husband and the boy with the water of life. Straightway they revived, and from that time forward they knew neither sorrow nor separation, but they all lived together long and happily. Another lively sketch of a peasant's love-making is given in the introduction to the story of Ivan the Widow's Son and Grisha. The tale is one of magic and enchantment, of living clouds and seven-headed snakes, but the opening is a little piece of still life very quaintly portrayed. A certain villager named Trafim, having been unable to find a wife, his aunt Melania comes to his aid, promising to procure him an interview with a widow who has been left well provided for, and whose personal appearance is attractive. Real blood and milk. When she's got on her holiday clothes, she's as fine as a peacock. Trafim grovels with gratitude at his aunt's feet. My own dear auntie Melania Prokhorovna, get me married for heaven's sake. I'll buy you an embroidered kerchief in return, the very best in the whole market. The widow comes to pay Melania a visit and is induced to believe, on the evidence of beans frequently used for the purpose of divination, that her destined husband is close at hand. At this propitious moment, Trofim appears. Melania makes a little speech to the young couple, ending her recommendation to get married with the words, I can see well enough by the bridegroom's eyes that the bride is to his taste, only I don't know what the bride thinks about taking him. I don't mind, says the widow. Well then, glory be to God. Now stand up, we'll say a prayer before the holy pictures. Then give each other a kiss and go in heaven's name and get married at once. And so the question is settled. End of part two. Recording by Kevin Davidson. www.blogordie.com